and then minimize disco uh, after I start streaming my screen to you. Okay, perfect. Can you see Notepad++? Plus plus? And you can see RiftKit now? Yeah. yeah Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about like tempo just as a general concept. And we'll move into its uses for different players. Because the biggest sort of like problem with this is that it's a rather abstract concept. And a lot of the time when you're teaching it to people, you will teach them a different sort of flavor of it so it makes the most sense to them. So let's start with where your understanding is. Um, like, what does tempo mean to you? And then we'll move into like actual general strict definitions. Yeah. So I think generally it is like who has like when you when you say we have tempo or they have tempo, it's it's more like who has control of the map and who is like at a point where they could do things with effectiveness. So if one team has like shoving waves into towers, or maybe they have a rift herald and they're about to put it in the lane to try and secure a neutral objective, that would be the enemy team having tempo on you because they have the first move because of these pushing minions, the fact that they have herald, all of these external factors. Okay. So a lot of this is pretty good. Um, in terms of what you're talking about here, this is a lot of what I end up talking about with players in terms of like tempo as a meaningful thing to them. And what you're talking about here is largely what I end up talking about with coaches that I work with for what it should mean to them. So let's break it down. Let's talk about it from a player level and then we'll talk about it from an overall game concept level, okay? Okay. So what I usually tell players when I work with them is that tempo is a resource. Have you heard that before? So it's really helpful for people when they're trying to gamify a concept to think of things as resources or rewards or something, right? And what I mean when I say tempo is a resource is I define it as like this quantity T for time that you can spend not like accruing like gold or experience without losing anything. So this is much more obvious for a laner than a jungler, but we can start with that, okay? So, if we look at our rift kit, let's say you're a mid laner, right? Okay. And you have your wave in neutral, and the enemy has their wave in neutral, and the map is inverted so the blue is on the wrong side, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> right. Currently, if you as this uh, blue side player, we're going to leave your lane. You wouldn't have tempo when you move because you'd be losing out on the access to the golden experience from this wave, right? Right. So what I usually tell players is that tempo is this idea that when you leave your lane, you want to not be missing anything. I tell them that there's basically three sort of states in their wave where they have tempo, where they've crashed, something and so they don't have to worry about getting the next wave that's coming because it's going to be preserved under tower um when they've created a freeze that the opponent isn't in lane to break so let's say your opponent resets and then you freeze them generally speaking that does create tempo but not as much as a crash for example and the last idea is if your opponent freezes you I tell people that this is when tempo is created for you as well. Can you think about why that might be? Why it's why there's tempo when you have a freeze? Why there's tempo when your opponent freezes on you? Because he's holding the minions in a specific spot. So if he wants to leave and like follow you and do whatever he can, but he then kind of forfeits that freeze, which I would say a freeze is an advantage on someone. So when you when you hold a freeze, they have to sit there and kind of almost commit to it to deny you these resources. So you have a kind of window to just like 
take off and do whatever you want. That's one idea, that is correct. But there's actually a second idea as well. Have you taken an economics course before? No. Okay. I was actually in high school once. <laughs> okay, in high school did you guys talk about something called opportunity cost? No. So opportunity cost, put really simply, is the most expensive cost of making a decision. So, for example, if you enjoy eating at Burger King and you enjoy eating at McDonald's, and you have to choose between eating one of them, right? For lunch. And you enjoy eating Burger King more, so you decide to eat Burger King for some reason. Then the opportunity cost of choosing to eat at Burger King is the enjoyment you would have gotten from eating at McDonald's. I'm following. You said you don't follow? No, I'm say I said I am following. Okay, perfect, perfect. And so, generally speaking, we say that somebody who is making good decisions is maximizing the amount of enjoyment or utils that they get from their decisions while minimizing the opportunity cost, right? And so, here, let's say that you're being frozen. You cannot break the freeze unless you have the materials to do so, and in which case it's not really a freeze, right? Like, if you freeze on Sivir, she just kind of laughs at you and throws your Q at the wave. Um, but if you're like a melee champion that doesn't have good wave breaking access, like if you're LeBlanc against Malzahar and Malzahar freezes on you, then you're kind of like, well, unlucky, I guess, right? You're not going to break that wave without getting killed. So we consider this having tempo because you're not actually losing gold or XP that you would, should be getting if you leave the lane. If you leave the lane right now and don't get this gold and XP, it's the same as if you stayed in the lane and didn't get that gold and XP because you're zoned. And instead, you're at least getting some kind of like opportunity to do a thing, right? Make sense? Yeah. Cool. So let's talk about junglers now. Junglers have a slightly modified definition of this tempo as a resource thing. Because junglers accrue gold and experience um, from their clear, and the most efficient, or like, unless you're like the most efficient farming junglers, you're going to always have camps that you can go to provided you're not getting invaded or something. Thinking about it in terms of time you can spend without losing gold or XP isn't as helpful. You see what I mean? Yeah. So instead what we say is tempo is measuring whether you are successfully getting the most gold XP to pressure ratio that you can. So for example, if you're playing an early game jungler, let's say that you're classic Lee Sin player, right? Or actually a better example is Elise because she's not a champion at level four. <laughs> so Elise doesn't necessarily care as much about these resources, but she still needs them to get to that level three spike. After that point, let's say you're Elise, you just did your, your, uh, uh, your, oh my god, I had a brain collapse. Your three camp, you see where your lanes are, right? Are you going to get more value out of starting down, like, some matchup top lane that's super, like, important for the game state? Or if by killing your blue buff? Probably killing the guy. Yeah, probably killing the guy. And the idea here is that, in this case, your tempo is still a resource. It's just that instead of like looking at it in terms of like refreshable like gold XP that you're getting um, from sources that come down your lane, at, you're thinking about it more as maximizing this. This idea of how junglers think about tempo is sort of what we talk about with laners once they understand that first idea. But you have to start with it for junglers because they don't have lanes to go to. And from there we spring into this sort of coaching idea of how it does tempo work. Because obviously you've heard people use tempo to talk about things that aren't lane states and jungle players, right? Mm -hmm. So take a stab at it. We've been talking about tempo as a resource. And the jungle definition that we used is going to... Um, 
play into how we think about tempo as a coach as well. I think it's... Damn. I don't know how to, like, approach it. But okay. I feel it's, a mo it's more, like, generalized. Because, like, laner to laner to jungler, it's, it's very, like, one-off. Where like the top lane tempo is a little bit different from the mid, which is a little bit different from the bot, which is a little bit different from the jungle. But if you want to look at it as a whole, you have to kind of evaluate where everyone is at. Like, mm -hmm. so if you are a jungler and you're clearing faster than the other jungler, and you want to go top, but your top laner is 10% HP because he's getting his shit kicked in. You, like there's not a lot of value going top because you know you could he could just get himself killed and you could just waste your time sure so you could go like mid lane or go somewhere else so i think it's it basically the point i'm trying to make is it's more like generalized and map oriented rather than like individual to individual oriented okay so what you said makes sense effective decision making is a part of tempo as in tempo contributes to making the correct decisions right um, let's start with a general concept, and then we'll use a specific scenario, okay? Okay. So, have you heard me talk about uh, wave state pathing synchronicity? No, not personally. Okay. All the words are words you've heard before, right? Yeah. <laughs> so break it down. Um, you probably want to manage your waves while also considering where your jungler is. So if your jungler is about to come top lane like every other jungler this season does where they do a five camp clear or a six clamp clear into top lane, as a top laner, you might want to hold a freeze or do your very best to hold a freeze at around three minutes and 20 seconds. That is a good example. So this idea of if you're a top laner having good wave state pathing synchronicity is making it so that your wave is in a correct place for your jungler to have options. This is an idea that is good. Um, but let's say you're the bot lane in this example. In this same example where the, the junglers go in top lane? Mm -hmm. I would say you probably... I don't know much about bot lane anymore, but... It might be a possibility to try and get a reset by crashing a wave or two, but I don't. It might be too early because it is like only three minutes and. So it sort of depends, right? Recall. Yeah, yeah you can cheat her. It's possible, right? But mm -hmm. we actually, I, I asked you a, a trick question. I'm sorry, it was a little dirty. Um, you can't answer that question without knowing what the enemy jungler is doing. That makes a lot of sense. Because the pathing path here isn't only your junglers; it's the enemy junglers as well. So, let's say, for this example, that you don't know. They did a leashless start, and they're a jungler that has the opportunity to gank early, but also doesn't mind power farming. The the true, like, terrifying, like, it's fucking first strike fiddlesticks jungle, we're not even sure if he did a double camp bot start, right? <laughs> right. You said you're not super comfortable with bot lane, so we can reverse this if it makes it easier for you to think about it in terms of top lane. Effectively, it's sort of a similar idea. Yeah, I mean, I imagine you would want a ward somewhere, but in order to, like, leave your lane and get a ward, you would have to sacrifice as little minions as possible. Hmm. And an effective way to do that is... Well, because you can't really leave it in a neutral state, because mm -hmm. they just kill the minions and then they say, hey, look, this guy's being stupid, let's go kill him to his own jungler. Hmm. So maybe a shove, but then that doesn't really work because if the enemy jungler is passing towards you, then they, they just go both kill you. Again. So it... I don't... Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on an answer. Okay, let's break it down. So if you're sort of unclear as to the jungler's location, and you know that your jungler is going to be cross back to you, if we're talking about the idea of tempo... It sort of depends on your matchup, but if you have control, you want to get the greatest value at the lowest risk, because there shouldn't be people able to respond to what you're doing. 
um, to help you from your team. Except for your mid laner, who is already looking towards this play instead, because generally speaking, two pronged plays are going to be more expensive. Right. So, if your matchup is sufficiently safe, you have like good escapes and you have control of the wave, you can slow and crash the wave and use the tempo from that crash to look for shallow vision. That's an option. However, if you don't have control over the wave, then the biggest thing that you need to do is to make sure that you are not actually allowing the wave to move away from you so that you can't receive plays. It wouldn't be your job to get vision in that context. So the here, if we're using the idea of wave state pathing synchronicity correctly, and we're using it within the context of tempo, what we're looking at is the idea of maximizing the value you get while minimizing the risk you take. So, a better example of this is a mistake as opposed to the correct play. We'll talk about mid lane in the same context, right? Right. Mid lane is the position where maximizing your tempo usage is the most important, which is why sometimes you'll see teams like, you know, if you've ever watched like uh, Caps play on G2, and you'll see he'll do these weird roams where he just like leaves the lane, puts a ward, and comes back, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the time, they're using a disruption technique called tempo debt, where you literally spend tempo that you do not have with the idea that the value you get from spending tempo that you don't have will create um, like opportunities for you to do things that make up for the debt you're putting yourself into. That makes sense? Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, and so, with this context of value for risk, like optimization, if your mid laner here knows Jungler's down here. We don't know where the enemy jungle started. And we uh, are able to create tempo in topside. And bot lane is trying to receive. If we can create tempo in our matchup, what should we do with it? Probably follow uh, <clears throat> your jungler to the bot play. Okay. Hmm? That may be expensive to do early in the game. There's something easier that we can spend the tempo on more briefly that will make one of these things much better without actually moving all the way to a lane. I'm just getting a ward in the jungle, maybe one on raptors or anywhere else. Yeah, yeah you're exactly right. Getting vision on the vision line axis of a jungler's clear lets you make more informed decisions, not just for your lane, but if your teammates have brains, then their lanes as well. So if you're the mid laner in this game, and you get this Raptors ward, and when you get it, you see that Raptors have been cleared, and we're on first clear and jungle is matching this way, right? As a top laner now, you actually can make decisions about how to control waves two, waves three. And this is the idea of like sort of coach wide macro tempo that you get used a lot, where we want to spend tempo as an individual in a way that gives the team opportunities to do things. And it does get a little bit more complex than this sometimes. Sometimes you will see like, oh, it was bad tempo to kill this instead of reset because now we're late to dragon set up in the river or something. But it still falls within that understanding of like maximizing value and minimizing risk. In this case, that would be a failure to minimize risk since now you have to breach river and you don't have vision set up correctly. And the value that you're getting from this knockdown inhibitor is probably not going to be worth the dragon if you're knocking down inhibitors at that point in the game. You see what I mean? Yeah. So that's, that's the general TLDR. Do you want to go into sort of cases that make it easier to understand or do you have holistic questions to start with i think i understand the general concept i didn't i i never thought of um the the tempo debt concept i actually really am a big fan of that one 
but um, no, it was uh, explained really well, actually. Thanks. The examples were great. I guess I'll look at chat then and see um, what they're saying. <laughs> Fiddle is flipping the game with the top lane gank on first clear, and you should know the guy. Yeah, yeah, obviously, with context, Fiddlesticks shouldn't be doing some of these things as a champion specific, but we're just talking general cases to make the logic more understandable. Top lane matchup, don't let enemy top do their game plan 100% of the time, you'll lose. If you keep creeps equal or something. Yeah. So. Triple wave stat crashing, then you can 1v2, realm reset. Yeah, 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 all of these things are true. Um, what I would say is that a lot of the time, Ben, um, the way that we've seen tempo evolve in terms of usage for players who are better is that it will come down to mind games because players who are under a certain level of experience with the game won't even know what it is. And then as players learn what it is, they have to learn to start using it. And so you'll have these stages of development where they like they know what it is, but they can't use it. And then they'll know how to use it, but only if the other person doesn't stop them. And then they'll know how it works and how to sort of play that chess game of who can actually create tempo in matchups where that matters. And then finally, we get to this stage that you're talking about where um, a lot of the time you won't see tempo being generated or spent at all because the parts of creating tempo in a lane especially are heavily telegraphed, right? If you create a giant wave to crash, it's really clear what time that wave needs to crash, and if you don't crash the wave, then um, you're in a position to be frozen on, and then the consequences of that, etc. So you'll see people especially in longer lanes, who are trying to create tempo, if they don't do it without the aid of an outside force, they get targeted as a result of the play. And so this is, I believe, what you're talking about, uh, Ben. Is that right? Actually, okay. would you like to see a competitive... Oh, let me see. Pro CS Charles number two for because essentially created a book on how to play standard CS because they're in intimate knowledge of adapt and learn to play. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I actually have an example. Let's see if I can find it. There's a, a really fun game that I like to watch and talk about. Uh, but I have, to, I have to find it on YouTube. I didn't think to pull it up. It was 2021 Spring Split, I think, in China. Yeah, this is the game. I love this. This game is a, a quality um, game to talk about in terms of the use of tempo, as well as introducing a concept called disruption, which is a type of system. Are you familiar with systems at all? Uh, in what regard? So there's a concept called systems, which is basically like your coach or staff or team comes to the decision that they want to play a particular strategy. And system is the way that you go about thinking of objectives and what kind of objectives you're targeting. Um, is your objective controlling vision? Like, is vision your objective? Is the opponent's play, like, stopping that from happening and shutting it down your objective? Are you more of a juvenile team and you're still learning how to play for timers and stuff, so waves are your objective? Those sorts of questions are, if you answer those questions systematically, then you'll end up with a system. I have a document that explains systems and gives examples of systems with competitive historical examples that I can send you if that explanation isn't sufficient for right now, or if you just want to read into it more. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. I did have another question, whatever you'd... Yeah, yeah, no, ask questions as they come to you. You're the one that's on the call, right? Right, but I, I did want to uh, hear the end of this content before I jump into a completely different one. Oh, we're about to jump into a long talk, so go ahead and make your question. I won't forget what we're going to talk about. Okay. So, if you have a, like, a full clearing jungler, someone who just, like, cannot do anything on the map, like, before level 6, so... 
like Fiddlesticks or Shivana or anyone similar to that, how would you go about creating tempo as a mid laner to kind of make sure that your jungler doesn't just get railed by like a more early game oriented, like Trundle or something like that? Sorry, ask me the question one more time. I was kind of not listening to you. Okay. So with a pre-level 6 jungler, mm -hmm. as a mid laner, how would you go about creating tempo so that your jungler doesn't get kind of railed by like a trundle or something, or someone who would like generally counter your champion? So as a mid laner specifically, tempo yes. is only generatable if you control the wave. So, to better answer your question, if your matchup allows, what you want to do is create pushes that are difficult for the jungle on the enemy team to contest without ruining their temp like their their clear speed, right? And crash those waves at times that you expect your jungler is going to need help. So the classic example is your jungler is about to go get crab. You've crashed your third wave, and so you're in position at three minutes to dissuade the enemy jungler from taking crab from your jungler. Um, it becomes more complex than that if your jungler is getting invaded, like late invade or whatever, right? And then you may end up going into tempo debt in order to deal with that sort of thing if you don't expect it ahead of time. But that's the idea. If you don't control the wave, you can't create tempo if you're a laner. So that's 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 how it is. That's unfortunate. Okay. Yeah, that's a good answer to my question. Thank you. This, by the way, is why it's so important, especially if you're picking a jungler that's weak early, like Kindred, um, in terms of like, oh, they get invaded and they lose the game, right? Um, that it's really important you have laners that can create tempo for them. So if you blind pick Kindred, they get counterpicked, and then you also have no prio, you lose the game. It's why um, when I was looking at your drafts last night for your scrim, I was like Peepo Sag at that game one draft because you had three losing lanes and then you had a jungler that needed to try and do something with them. You know what I mean? That's actually... I know you guys haven't done VOD reviews with your team, but the biggest problem that you all have as a team is that you aren't thinking about how to spend your time ahead of time in a way where, like, when you draft winning lanes, um, you're playing around those lanes in a way that actually generates you advantages. Like, when you lose games, that's consistently what's going wrong. Food for thought. So, this game. This is Billy Billy Gaming vs. E-Star. It's from, like, more than a year ago now. But what we're going to talk about, the only things, like, meta relevant that you need to know is that, um, like, this is back when Olaf was, like, cringer strong, like, disgustingly strong, as opposed to, like, it's before the Olaf rework, but in the period of time in last year where, like, he was strong without the rework. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, what we're going to see this game is, because this is a dragon meta, we're going to see this composition, which is clearly tooled for a mid-game play. Um, they're going to look to prioritize dragons, and they're going to do their best to obfuscate when they're trying to create tempo for dragons. And we're going to watch this team do what they can to read what they're doing and stop it. So this is the team that you would look at if you're looking to understand the systems for disruption. And because we're looking at disruption in this way, we're going to talk about watching wave control attempts to create tempo and how we can recognize them in advance. Make sense? Yes. Okie dokie. So, if we go into the game, we don't care too much about our level 1 states. The really important thing to know is that neither side of the game knows which side of the, the jungle the other jungler is starting in this game. You're going to notice that neither side leashes. I believe. So you see, we have... And in this meta, Graves does not want to run into Olaf in the, at the crowd, because it, it's really bad news for him. Right. Yeah. So, Jace can hold Pryo against Kinen. He controls the wave against Kinen if the Jace player has hands. Twisted Fate can create tempo against Syndra, 
if Syndra doesn't spend her mana, if Syndra send, spends mana, she can go into a, like a deficit in terms of like ability to control the wave in the future in order to get control at a particular moment. And the same is true with Kaisa, where she can spend mana to have shove over Jin, but Jin will naturally shove into her. Make sense? Yeah. This is stuff that like I don't need you to understand. You can just take it from me, and you can, as you understand the game more and more for every role, you can see it when you watch competitive. So, dragon still spawns same time. This is before the camp respawn change, so these camps will respawn faster than you think they do. But besides that, everything else is the same. And what we're going to see is both junglers making their way down. And we can see bot lane has started creating this early shove into Jin before he can like match it so they can bounce it, which is something that I've talked with Nick before about. What's the idea here? Why are they doing that? Because they want to... I'm guessing what that support is about to go do is he's about to go put a ward in the enemy jungle so that they can confirm where this Graves is clearing. Okay, so getting information on the enemy jungle clear is the first step, that's true. They're spending tempo to get vision, which is the classic example of that. But there's actually more to it than that. This is one of those really cool double-pronged things. Do you see what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. So if the wave bouncing back ends up being disadvantageous, Kaisa can always try to push it back out. But here, what they're doing is, if Graves happens not to be bot side, they can chain the play where they get they spend their tempo to get vision, and then use when they're naturally losing tempo to create a vulnerability on the enemy. And all of this is pretty standard stuff in in professional competitive, which is why we're watching two teams that you've never heard of and they're still doing it correctly. <laughs> Hannah who Billaby Gaming is now. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> and you'll see, even though Graves is on the cross side of the map, if you look at how Kanan and Jace are standing, even though he's potentially vulnerable to Olaf, because bot side are playing the way that they are, Jace is pretty confident that he can play the way that he is, where he's going to start creating pressure on this Kanan in the matchup the way that he's supposed to. So this isn't an example of WPS, but it's an example where all three of the lanes are doing it purposefully. Like there's an example of each lane using their ability to create tempo or not create tempo in a way that's valuable. I promise we're not watching this whole game. Okay, so. Shen, uh, Shen did get the word you're talking about. That's why they're spotting out graves on the bot side of the jungle now. And Olaf is like really people happy about this because Syndra has Pryo. Balin has Pryo. If Graves walks to get this crab, he's incredibly depressed. You see that? Yeah. And so things are, are looking well in Hoosville. And Graves, having been spot out on the ward because of the timing that it was placed knows that he's walking into the, the like the danger zone basically. Right. So he sees this Olaf and he sees the Olaf's camp count. And now the next sort of like five minutes of the game are the most important five minutes of the game. Alright? This is why I uh get really angry when I see um when I see junglers showing needlessly, right? Can you guess what's about to happen? Um, the the Ola or the um, the Graves knows that they did the same clear, and the the Jace is kind of like winning top lane. So what I'm guessing is that the Graves is gonna try and go to the other scuttle with his top laner. So Graves definitely can have eyes for the other scuttle. What I want you to see is that we have teleport advantage mid lane, a resource deficit from holding prio early, and the fact that Jace is still going to be able to hold control over this. 
So crab is an idea that we can have a look for, right? But we also are getting... Have you read um, DOPA's TF guide before? No. No, I have not. Are you familiar with why TF takes minion DMAP? Um, I am familiar of the rune. There you familiar with what? Is, there might be a very specific reason why mm -hmm. you take it, yep. but... I, I'm not aware of that specific reason. So the reason why it's, you see a lot of TF players take minion DMAT is so that you can nix three casters before you hit six, so that you can reset at five, teleport back to lane, full resources, and with two Qs, kill the caster minions on that next wave and shove it very quickly so that you can get your six and immediately gank bot lane. It's a, it's a very well-refined <laughs> Twisted Fate strategy in competitive especially, but also in very high low solo. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, in this game, what we're going to see... Wait, what do you mean? Why wouldn't Billy just be playing topside and then looking to rotate around the map? Uh, the answer to your question, Ben, is that dragons are so strong in the meta at the time of this game that giving early dragons at all to this team means that they're able to play for an early soul, which would be really hard for them to play through because of when their mid key composition mid-game spikes. If they can delay even one dragon, then it's just like winning for them, basically. Uh, but that, that's a meta-relevant question, so it's it's good that you ask. So here we see TF. He's got teleport. He's not too worried. He's willing to trade a lot of HP to keep this wave from being too unplayable. And we see that Jace here uses the tempo that he created to get a scuttle ward so that they can make a decision about Olaf. Because now they're either going to see Olaf on this, know that he's going to do crab into reset into either full or partial reset partial for dragon because of the timer in the game. Or we're going to see that he doesn't show on this and he's going to do partial reset partial, probably. And we can reinforce that with the vision that TF is going to get from having tempo from reset with teleport, having resources that Cinder doesn't have. That's the sort of like, this is what we're seeing, like 60 seconds, two waves, in the future. This is what we need to be talking about as a team, you see? I said a bunch of different things all contiguously, so... Yeah, I'm just trying to take it all in and then realize that you need to think of this shit, like, before it even happens. Well, you, as a player that's not playing, like, pro level... It's not playing like yeah. academy level. Like, I'm not expecting you to do this, right? This is just yeah. where you, if your goal is to like become one of the best of the best, this is your goal. But like, don't feel bad if you're not doing this right now. You know what I mean? Yeah, obviously. But it, it is pretty like daunting when you look at it like this. Hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. Especially because like, the level of communication and understanding of the game that a whole team has to have at once to do this stuff is like, you know, that's, that's why they have a salary that's livable. Right. So, TF teleports back to lane. This is pre-TP change, so he can actually teleport to wards still. XD. <laughs> and um, Graves is going to not get double crabbed in the meta where getting double crabbed is really bad for you, especially if you're a power main jungler. And now, TF is going to do two things. He's going to pretend to ward raptors to give a false ward timer, which is why he walked up like that, stopped, and then walked back to the lane. And you actually probably saw the blue ping down here, like they have vision. Yeah. And the reason he's giving that wrong ward timer is because he wants Olaf to think about where the ward is at the wrong time so he can catch him on his path when he puts the ward down that he's going to put down later. You don't have to do this in your solo queue. It, it won't give you that much of an advantage. You gotta set it somewhere. <laughs> and now TF doesn't care. He's got a level advantage. He's gonna hit six first. He doesn't have to worry about Syndra all inning him. The only thing that would ruin his lane is if Olaf comes, and if Olaf comes, their dragon is delayed. And if their dragon is delayed, like we already mentioned, then that's really bad news bears. So TF now walks into the jungle, and he puts that ward down by the raptors to catch Olaf's clear, and he's gonna put the ward down in a very specific place where it's going to catch Olaf if he walks off this way, but also if he walks off this way. And that's very important, because we want to know what Olaf's plan is after he starts the partial on bot side. 
So I didn't mention what the definition of disruption is. You want to take a guess at it before we go into like the super deep ideas? I assume, so you said that there are other systems. There are. And I assume that disruption is basically like kind of exactly what it's, um, like it's, it's exactly that. It's just disrupting the enemy. You have to recognize what the enemy team wants to do. Mm -hmm. and then you have to play to kind of stop them from doing that. So exactly. you're not going in with a plan of your own, but just like saying, hey, you know your plan? Well, no, we're, we're good. You're not going to do that. Great. That's perfect. So we in, in, the, in the, the nomenclature of what systems are, we talk about that as targeting the enemy's objective. That's what a disruption system does. And so... This is why sometimes you'll see like really weird shit in like more recent games where like the jungler will gank at an XP threshold where it looks like they're like a griefing by ganking, but then they level up in the middle of the gank on purpose and kill the enemy. <laughs> like this is the level of like we need to be thinking into the future like that works on the pro stage at this point, which is part of why watching disruption is so fun. Um, so anyway, Olaf is spotted out. He sweeps. He doesn't see the ward until it's too late, so Olaf is shown. And now... We know which way Olaf is going. Okay. Now look at the wave states on the map. We haven't talked about them in a minute. What's going on? Jace has no mana, and it looks like he's about to crash a wave. Uh huh. The um, the cannon here, and he has TP up, so it doesn't matter that he's recalling later than cannon because you can still TP to wards. Mm -hmm. Um, it like the taskbar is kind of blocking bot, but it looks like that they want to get that wave in because I think they're pinging it, so they want to shove in that wave because Jin also has no mana. So he's been using his abilities on the wave because he doesn't want the enemy team to get dragon. Okay. And so, let's talk about that. Jin has low resources. His allies are about to get a reasonable amount of resources. And with jungle tracking, we know what Olaf is thinking and what the enemy team is targeting. Is that right? Yeah. So what is this? They are spending their tempo to disrupt the enemy team. They are creating a bait. Oh. They're creating a poisoned objective. Like, you know, in chess when a piece is poisoned? Yes, I love chess. So yeah, that's what this is. It's a poisoned piece. If you eat this piece, if you make go for this play, then Twisted Fate hits 6, he kills you. Jace can look to teleport, bad things happen and the dragon is fundamentally going to be delayed. And that's what we're looking to do to disrupt this team, right? Right. And it's not like the nail in the coffin. This game could have been playable from after what happens. But this game ends very quickly. So you see that wave is coming back in. We know when Olaf is going to be here. Suddenly it's a 4v3. It's just the Shen support who dies, but now the dragon is delayed, right? Yeah. And that was the entire goal. And so Rift Herald is going to be the next macro neutral on the map that's targetable. And that's on the side of the map that E Star are comfortable, or sorry, that Billy Billy are comfortable playing, right? Right. And at this point, like, I don't, we don't have to go into it. You can watch it on your own time and sort of like look to see the same stuff that we were talking about and what happened for this delaying of the dragon. But it's going to happen pretty much like two, three more times in a row. They're either going to succeed or they're not. And by the time they're done, it's going to be such an unrecoverable state for a mid-game spiking team that this game just comes out on top for red side. Spoilers for a game that's more than a year old. <laughs> right. So that's the TLDR. I know we sort of drifted a little bit outside of the general concept of tempo and started talking about, like, pro usage of tempo. Yeah, but I did think it was, like, super valuable. And it was, like, information that I will 
start to recognize whenever I do decide to watch like any pro games at all. And it's some that I might think about implementing into like my own gameplay. Well, great. What role do you play mostly at this point? I play mid. Okay. So that was why like I asked the question about, you know, having about like kind of protecting your jungler as a mid laner or ways mm. to do so. So yeah, basically the uh, the answer to your question is what well, what do you usually play mid actually? Um, I played my main three champions are Yon, Yasuo, and Victor. Okay, so let's talk about these champions. How often do these champions have tempo for first clear? <laughs> Not very often. <laughs> like obviously it's matchup dependent, but I mean, like. Some obscene amount of the good mid laners right now are not melee champions. So, and especially like Yon and Yasuo, they're very weak early. Like they, their uh, kill pressure really comes in at around four to six. Mm -hmm. Whereas like levels one to three is when you need to, is when your jungler is doing his clear. So it's not not it's not good. Mm. It's not looking good for these guys. So this isn't me like saying like oh you should do this instead with when it comes to champion pools or whatever, right? Right. But one of the reasons why I have a lot of success playing the RA champion, and why I'm a big fan of the RA champion um, in specific right now, is that she does have control over the wave in most matchups, like 1 to 4. And she can do it without spending all of her mana. So if you look at RA games where I get ahead early, Largely what's happening is I'm not like solo killing lane opponents like you might want to be looking to do with these champions, right? It's sort of like, uh, you know the meme about Katarina where it's like, you don't die to her in lane, she goes bot lane at 12 minutes, double kills, and then the game is over? Yeah. Well, the idea is sort of similar, where like, I don't necessarily solo kill you level 2 as Ari, but then I walk into your topside jungle off of a 2 or 3 crash, kill your jungler at crab, and then I can use that to continuously push you in and go kill your bot lane. Or your top lane. Or your jungler. Right. One of the best things you can learn regarding tempo as a mid laner specifically is that it's your job. You are the actual jungler. If you let your jungler do all of the macro stuff as a mid laner, then you deserve to lose the games that you lose. <laughs> um, that's why you're the center of the map. That's why so many mid laners have semi globals that affect side lanes without leaving, like Swain W or Ziggs Ultimate or Karthus, Zeroth Ultimate. And if they don't have that, then they have good enough push where they can either stop the other person from moving or they can move themselves. Um, that's that's that the fundamentally what makes a good viable mid laner almost all the time is that sort of like condition, which is why. Um, Bruisers have pretty good matchups into a lot of mid lane champions. Like if you run a mid lane champion top lane, sometimes you're just asking to lose because it's like, what are you going to do to set? He's just going to kill you. But yeah. also why set isn't meta more of the time, because if he uses his spells to clear the wave, um, then he can't, he can't fend off if they get trading onto him and enough champions mid lane can basically prevent him from spending tempo that he's basically asking his team to carry him every game. Some metas, Set does control the wave. He has strong enough clear with Core Drinker Spike, or his matchups are so good that you can justify running him mid. But the TLDR is, like, that's why he's not like, oh, I just blind pick Set mid every game, you know what I mean? Yeah. Cool. Do you have any other uh, ideas you wanted to talk about? Not really an idea, but more of a question. So what, um... So you explained why you liked Ari. It's because, you know, she has a lot of shove early and she can kind of like half spend resources to go do like fun stuff yeah. anywhere else. So in regards to, you know, my my two best champions, Yone and Yasuo, what would you say is like their objective for the first couple levels? So the biggest thing about Yone and Yasuo is almost more than any other champion in the game, but not quite. They need to get to spikes. Spikes are a big part of tempo that we didn't really talk about, but basically there are going to be times where you are stronger naturally because you are hitting a spike. You hit your level 6, you got your Manamune on Corky, etc. And um, at that point, 
you can do things more easily than at other points in the game because you're naturally stronger. Yone and Yasuo have a couple really big spikes, and they want to use those spikes to create advantages. You're Yone. You reset and buy Berserkers. You come back to lane, and all of a sudden you're like, it's like when GP resets with Futures Market and comes back to lane level 4 with Sheen. Like, what do you do? Well, that was before this patch. Maybe not anymore, but like, you right, see what I mean? Right. Um, yeah. You want to use those spikes to, to like, spend whatever you can do to get an advantage that was worth spending it. And be patient, because your champion pool is a champion pool where, like, 25 minutes, if you haven't, like, into the game, your champion is naturally strong. And you you can take advantage of that strength, but it may be because your champion is naturally stronger at that time and weaker early, that you need to use that strength to overcome a deficit that you like accrued by picking that champion in the first place. So like, if you don't mind talking about bot lane for a second, because it's easier for me to explain it this way. When you think of Lucian, you think of Lucian being a champion who, like, he wants to use his early pressure to create a lead where he can use that lead to win the game, right? Right. And in a meta where, um, like, crit AD carries are unquestionably strong, it's not that Lucian doesn't beat Jinx early, right? It's that Jinx gets to a point in the game where even though Lucian is, like, created this lead, the lead doesn't mean that he's stronger in terms of contribution to the team fight any more than she is. And she wins the game from there because she's outscaled him, because she's able to create more pressure with the resources that she accrued, even if those resources aren't necessarily even. So with Yone and Yasuo, you know, some of the best scaling characters in the game, just by nature of like their f build flexibility, the amount of damage they can output, the durability that they can accrue, the amount of like team fight pressure that they have, especially Yone, where you push the R key at the right time and you catch the entire enemy team in a yeah. massive CC ability, then snap back to reality. Um, like, you want to be using these champions in a way where like you're not feeling pressured to create advantages, but you're not forgetting to take them if they are given to you. Also, to be perfectly honest, Yone isn't very good right now, so he's not going to be easy to do that with. But, yeah, it's my experience that, well, okay, whenever whenever Vex is strong, Yone is, generally speaking, not going to be, you know what I mean? But, like... Yeah. You think Vex is good at it? Vex is very good right now. Really? Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm... Yone is, like, my best champ, so on the team we play on, whenever it's just, like, not banned, it's just like, okay, pick it. And then mm. we kind of just win. And then you get the Talia matchup, and you're like, wow, that was really painful, you know what I mean? I mean... That, like, the matchup itself... Actually, I guess it was the matchup. You're right, because I will talk about a lot of the in-game that I went through. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, she's going to have a lot of pressure on me through le throughout levels like 1 through 3, or at least until I get my Berserker's Graves. Right. So, you know, for a lot of the lane, I was just kind of stuck behind my, uh, like, under my tower, near my tower. Basically, I wasn't allowed to cross the midpoint of the lane. I had to make sure I wasn't going to get ganked, any of that stuff. But, you know, as soon as the opportunity arose for the enemy jungler to just, you know, go and say hi to my jungler, he just walked all, walked along a wall and just killed him. Exactly. Yeah, it's not even necessarily that Yone can't kill Talia. It's just that she has a much easier time creating yeah. tempo in the lane. Yeah, because she can just shove in a wave, glide along a wall, and just, like, go do whatever the hell she wants. And I, I can't... Like, frankly, I just can't do much. Yeah, you literally can't stop her, because if you try to dash into her, she stuns you and throws you away. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that in particular is a bad matchup. I'm not saying, like, oh, you can never pick Yone. Like, when you run a team, yeah. a lot of the time, if you're drafting, you have to balance the, the sort of flat strength of a character with your player's ability to play, right? It's why, uh, if you look at some of my old North American drafts, you'll see, like, Corky and Zillion top lane. Because my top laner was a crackhead and like won games with that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you can make characters work even if they're not good, right? A character's strength, like th how good they are, their viability, doesn't yeah. mean that you can't win games on them. Like even Rise has a forty percent win rate. He still wins forty percent of his games, right? Right. 
I wasn't like that game. Yeah, it went pretty bad, and we you know got shit on. But most of the time, I think just like my mechanical prowess on the champion and just my level of understanding on him is good enough to you know get me through whatever I need to get through in order to be in a winning position. Well, great. I mean, that means that you're in a position where your mental stack is sort of primed to think about things that aren't the champion's mechanics, that lets you think about tempo, it lets you think about wave state pathing, it lets you yeah. do all of these things that if you're just put randomly onto Malphite, okay, he's simple, but you have to think about pushing the R key still. Yeah, exactly. Because for, for a lot, like, the whole reason I even asked you for this is because... Like, obviously, we brought up the whole ADC thing where, you know, we were thinking about the game differently or I was, like, being an idiot or whatever. Well, I mean, I wasn't going to say that. Well, I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, a lot of the way I've been playing hasn't really, like, it's been in the back of my mind, right? Like, oh, when I buy Mythic, I am strong. When I buy Boots, I am strong. It's very, like, basic caveman Uga Booga thinking where it's, like, you know, it obviously, right? But I, mean, I sure. wanted to kind of explore, like, what else, like, what the possibilities are for, like, myself and my understanding of the game. Sure. I have a, I have a question for you, then, since this sounds like some of this is, like, your first time experiencing it. Right. Now that you've sort of encountered this, this information, like, it's not particularly esoteric, right? Like, it seems pretty obvious now that we talked about it, right? The thing that I find is that a lot of the the high level concepts of this game are not complex to understand. It's just that implementing them constantly into your game, having a consistent ability to process all of the little things at once in the background, where you in the foreground are thinking about the things that you need to think about on a macro level to win the game. That's what makes the game challenging. Like, I can sit here and talk to you about, like, Billy Billy's gaming right, against uh, E-Star and how they shut them out of the game, right? But I, myself, with my hands and brain, have a hard time doing that in-game. The in-game stress. There's a very big disconnect between looking at something and saying, Hey, look! Yeah. He's doing it, versus, like, actually playing in the game and being like, Oh, shit, they're doing that to us, we're gonna fucking lose. Exactly. But, yeah. I cool. definitely think that, um... Like, a lot of slow, easy concepts I should, like, definitely start with. Because the good thing is that I've played jungle competitively, so I know at least what you are what you should be doing. Hmm. So that's helped me a lot with, like, my mid lane, because I, I played jungle for a quick split. You uh, helped me out with that a little bit. And it's... It's definitely a little polarizing, because when you play, like, low elo, like a laner... Like a laner role, like, you know, support, maybe like a bad supporter, like an AD carry or any other role. You start to realize just how, like, how much, like, little decisions can impact games, especially yeah. as a jungler. Yeah. Sometimes, like, you know, it's hyperbole a lot of the time when people are like, oh, this game is over. I lost my lane because, like, you know, they got froze on level two and then, like, they don't get CS for, like, a minute or whatever. But. The way that it changes your ability to generate resources down the road, it, I mean, it is true. It does create a disadvantage. That's the whole point of doing it. So. Yeah. And I think I'm going to stop taking such a like linear approach to the game. Because a lot of when I watch League and when I, like, I guess I can generalize it more to like when people who are around my skill level watch League and they consume content and whatever they're often thinking like very, very linear, like, okay, who has more gold? Who has more like wards on the map? Not like, okay, where is the gold? Where are the wards? Like, yeah, who's close to spikes? Are those spikes realistically gettable? Are they gonna align with neutrals that win the game? Are they gonna be able to close with their lead? Like, yeah. And this is why, like controversial, right? Like, you know how like LS is like really controversial for like hating Renekton sometimes when it seems like not justified, right? But the idea is, like, from from the vantage that he has, his, from his perspective of the game, he sees that, like, Renekton, the way that he's being used, is not creating a lasting advantage in a way that closes out games. That's, that's like, the fundamental, like, he's too simple, so, like, he's relatively easy to maneuver around, and then, like, the advantage he creates when used correctly isn't good enough. 
that's that's the idea that like comes from that right so it's like the fact that it's controversial to say that sort of thing is always funny to me because when you look at it as sort of like a, a function right like does this create the value that makes it worth grabbing from like a very black and white perspective you can understand the perspective i think mm -hmm. for example i don't necessarily agree because i think the argument um omits the idea of player skill uh expression when it comes to these sorts of things and so you'll have players who are like so unbelievably good at renekton compared to the rest of their pool that like <laughs> It's it's right. not justifiable to not pick them, right? Yeah, yeah. But um, but it helps when it comes to thinking about the game linearly. Like you're thinking to to think about are you considering all the factors? It's good that you're thinking about it like that way coming out of this for sure. Yeah, I definitely consumed a lot of information, so it's yeah, it's been like an hour. So if you if you yeah, it, if you're it's gonna take a little bit of time to you know process all of it think about it, start implementing it, and then going from there. Hmm. It's going to be a tenuous process, but I think I can do it. Yeah, it's totally... I think I have a good foundation to start. Hell yeah. And it's not like you're only allowed to talk to me this one time and never again. I'm just going to leave your <laughs> message on red. Like, if you have a question, last... ask it. You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm... I'm trying to... I've been trying to think of questions in the back of my head, but... No, nah, nah, it's okay. And if chat has questions too... um. You are free to ask them. I am reading chat now. If not, that's also completely fine. It's um, the kind of thing where, like, I like to do this when I'm bored. If I'm bored, then, like, I have time to answer questions about things. There's, like, at least six viewers in the chat, Jazzy, so... <laughs> it, it doesn't matter that you're retired. It, it improves, like, okay, so the idea that we talked about tempo, right? Tempo isn't a league-exclusive idea, right? You can think about tempo in terms of shooters, and it's just as valuable. If you play Valorant and your tempo is shit, then you're going to lose control of objectives the same way that you would in League. It's just that the way that you get to those objectives is physically different because you're playing a shooter instead of a MOBA. Um, it's why, like... Okay, you know some of the best like esports players that have a good fundamental understanding of tempo? T you want to take a guess at that, uh, Beanie? Sorry, can you repeat? I was kind of zoned up for a second. You're good. So what I said is, um, can you take a guess as to what esports players, generally speaking, have the best understanding of tempo? Probably league players. No. <laughs> really? League players, I, I thought, like, I have this conversation with, like, top not 1% league players all the time. So, is it it's really shooters? StarCraft, that makes so much sense. Right? And that's why you see so many StarCraft players that retired and became League of Legends coaches. Okay, that <laughs> that really does explain a lot, because a lot of times, like, League, like, I'll uh, be watching a League YouTuber or whatever, like, I'll use Double Lift, I'll, like, watch his podcast, and then a lot of them will say, oh, well, you know, I play StarCraft a lot, or, you know, I knew a couple of people that played StarCraft, and they're all, like, high-level players. Yeah. So that does explain a lot. And, well, you know, the other thing that StarCraft lets you do, right? Like, in addition to understanding tempo as a general concept, right? StarCraft is a lot about micromanaging a bunch of different things at once, improving your mental stack, so that you can use your mental stack to make macro decisions. Like, if you want to get really good at esports, StarCraft is actually really OP with everything, including mouse control. Like, it's really good for people to play games like that. A follow-up video on handwriting? I mean, I have terrible handwriting in real life, so bad that I actually made up my own sort of, like, shorthand so that I can read my handwriting later. <laughs> Honestly, I don't do the writing for people to see, I do the writing for me to feel like I said it correctly. I know that yeah. sounds really weird, but... No, no, I know exactly what you mean. It it feels like... I, I know what you mean. It's hard to explain for me, too. Cause yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying, like, everybody should therefore go get a subscription to Blizzard, because that company is awful, but, um... <laughs> right. But, 
it is it is an observable sort of like thing that we've seen. And honestly, understanding multiple games at once does make understanding one game in particular easier, right? That's why you see a lot of like card game uh, enthusiasts, we'll say, become coaches as well, like um, like MTG, for example, or Hearthstone. MTG more, but the idea is like it gives you a way of like systemically breaking down resources you have access to, and then understanding how best to use those resources. Like you can can you can you can refactor League of Legends to be a deck building game, especially if you think about draft in that way, right? right? I have somewhere on the XLNC site written a paper about this, but the TLDR is basically like, if you think about League of Legends draft as a deck building game, it makes drafting yourself losing lanes a lot harder. Because... Yeah, you can spot out like, hey look, I'm losing everywhere, what happened? Right. And that's that's why like, uh, are you familiar with LS's sort of like um, like MTG color system for no. champions? No. Not Have not. you ever played Magic the Gathering? Nope. Okay. Well, I'm going to give you a really quick TLDR, and I'm going to deviate from his explanation a little bit because I have appropriated it to make more sense to me in a different way, if that makes sense. It does. So basically, there are six colors that you can build a deck from in Magic the Gathering. Colors of mana, mana being a resource, and basically those colors are themed, right? So you have red, blue, green, I'm just going to write the front letter, I think, uh, black, white, and colorless. Very creative, I know. <laughs> and... Um, Basically, each of these colors has a strategy associated with it. And you can draft multiple colors together to assemble a deck, but you have to get the resources to play the cards to make them work, right? So, for example, red colors have a lot of early strength. They they win early, and generally they need to snowball and win a game off of that early strength, or they're going to be shot out of luck. So a great example of a red champion would be Renekton, in terms of, like, you know, just his general approach to the game, right? Renekton gets free prio in the lanes that you would pick him in. He uses that prio to create an advantage, either by diving and killing, or roaming and getting kills in the jungle, or blah 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 blah. And then, 30 minutes in the game, if Renekton hasn't won, he's probably gonna lose. Right? Right. Yeah. Uh, blue champions are champions that are scaling-oriented. They are champions that have, like, zone control as a feature of them, right? So when you think of a blue champion, you think of an artillery mage, you think of a control mage, you think of um, certain utility marksmen, right? So like, Zeroth is a blue champion. He, he, he can do nothing but control zones, and he's much stronger as the game goes on, right? Yeah. Green champions, champions that are, generally speaking, stronger when they are working with other champions to achieve some goal, they aren't necessarily not scaling oriented, but they're not generally spoke speaking like strong early, unless they're a mix of red green. And a good example of a, a green champion is Hecarim, right? Because while Hecarim is a red green champion generally, he's stronger early and like later in the game he falls off, the value that Hecarim provides is biggest when he's using onslaught into a team and like the entire team is feared and his team can capitalize on it, right? Like, sure, he can still 1v1 you if you're not a champion that can deal with him, but he provides the most value when he's with his team, right? We're on the same page? Yeah. Okay. Black champions are a little bit special. They are champions who have some higher strength than other champions, but it comes at a cost. Usually, in League of Legends, that cost is an execution cost. So, like, the perfect example of a black champion is Atrox, where you have to play his Q minigame to get the value out of the champion's damage. If you don't ever land Qs on Atrox, the champion is dog shit. But if you do land those Qs, then generally speaking, you're winning, because he's a red-black champion who's strong early, and also, you, you see what I mean? Yeah, I see what And then white champions are very utility-oriented. 
they provide a lot of recovery and generally speaking white champion on your team as a support like you know if you like if you want to think of an enchanter as a white champion pretty much every game that's acceptable you know what i mean and colorless they do some unique thing that makes the game special like bard or azir or uh you can think of blitzcrank as a colorless champion but he can be colored sometimes and so within the context of like assembling teams you'll notice that different teams with different systems and different play styles will assemble teams that have different color sprays and they're not going to be like one of each they're going to be like you know this team favors like red green top side with a blue bot side you know what i mean or like that kind of stuff and this is all stuff that's much more useful if you're an analyst or a coach that's trying to make a plan for your team but it doesn't hurt to know right like so from what you told me it sounds like your focus on champions tends to side towards black green there's a splash of blue with victor there's a splash of like sort of like colorless when it comes to the wind shitters. <laughs> right but the general like overall like way that it sounds like you and you play the game best is when you're playing within the context of like a black green game now you know the basics of magic the gathering for the future yeah i mean i guess although in the way that it operates in magic the gathering it, the game has become so complex compared to the breakdown that i just gave that like i mean everything i said is still true but you may not find that to be a sufficient explanation to play the card game, Jazzy, sorry. Um, so, yeah, yeah. If you understand that your, 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 your way that you think about winning the game comes from, like, champions who are extra strong, but they come at an execution cost, because the wind shitters are execution cost oriented, figured that out very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and green. There's a green spray in here, so you're stronger when you work with your team in some way. I can tell you, you are from watching your gameplay, you are much better at one of these things than you are at the other, if that makes sense. Uh, do you know what it is? or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I circled them in order. Like, you have mechanics. I've watched you play the game. Like, you're not a bad player, right? Right. And you specifically get in this headspace where you need to think about the game, like, how can I win this game? And it might help you moving forward as you consider, like, spending tempo and everything. To consider that your champions spend tempo best, most efficiently, when they're doing it in some way that empowers their team. I'm not saying go out and just give kills to your support, right? But what I am saying is that... Yeah, I know, I know what you are saying, though. Yeah, like, spend your tempo in a way that the advantage you create isn't only given to you. You're not playing Gangplank, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Cool. If that's, um... Do you have anything else, or...? No, I just started kind of talking, because I don't yeah. get to do this very much. I am pretty hungry, and I think I'm going to make some food. Cool. But this was, like, very, like, extremely informative. Uh, well, I'm happy to hear that I could provide some value. Yeah. Have, have a good meal, and uh, hit me up later if a question occurs to you and it's after we've hung up, okay? Yeah, for sure. Cool. Thanks for everybody who yeah. tuned in. Uh, hopefully it was just as informative for you guys, and uh, have a good evening.